good to see y'all this morning. It's been a while. It's been a while. I have enjoyed a much needed sabbatical from preaching. But uh, our lovely pastor let me know that that is over. <laughs> and it is time for me to do my duty. Let's pray. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to always come into the house of the Lord and worship with each other and fellowship with each other or to you. For you're the object of our worship and you're the object of our fellowship. Father, I pray that you would increase in me as I decrease. Lord, I pray that you would let your word flow. Lord, that you would let it fall upon open hearts. Lord, and that we will respond to the call, that we will respond to what it is that your word is teaching us. For your word told us to be more than just hearers of the word, but to be also doers. Amen. Have your way in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 So, I was getting ready to do this message. <clears throat> it had been a while since I've been in and, and first John, and so um, I was getting ready to do this message, and um, I was trying to kind of think of where I wanted to go with this passage. We're going to be um, in First John chapter two, verses twelve through fourteen. We're going to be in First John chapter two, verses twelve through fourteen, which is exactly where we left off in the fourth message um, when we covered um, the defense of love for the Christian believer. As you know, this book title, was, this book series, is titled "Given an Apology." Of against false teaching. Now, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go all the way back to all of the history, but we know that apologia means to give a defense, right? And so what are we defending? We're defending the truth of the gospel. We're defending the truth of who Christ is. And so throughout this whole book, that's what John is doing. And so we're going to take our time to learn of these defenses so that we can make them our own and that we can apply them to our own life. <clears throat> but as I got to this passage, I was thinking, I said, man, we're going to talk about a defense of remembering. And I always seems kind of weird. It sounds kind of weird. Um, but I'll explain it. But as I was getting ready for this message, this song just kept coming in my head. And, and it, was, it was an old Michael Jackson song that when I was a kid, I, I really liked a lot. And I know French died, but I don't know any of his songs, so we're going to use Michael Jackson. Um, but it was an old Michael Jackson song called Remember the Time. And so this whole song was about Michael Jackson trying to jog the memories of this girl so that she remember the time that they have and that she would eventually leave Mr. No Good and return back to him, right? So, you know, you see toward the end of the video, they kiss, and so it's assumed that he completed his mission and that she left Mr. No Good and he got his girl back, right? Odd, I know, odd. I will use that illustration, odd. But as odd as it seems, what Michael Jackson knew, or he was trying to portray in his video, was that he believed that if he can get her to just remember what they had, remember his love for her, that that remembrance would allow her to leave the thing that doesn't love her or the person who doesn't love her. And as odd as it seems, it's the same concept that Jesus teaches. You may remember in Revelations 2 when he talked about the church of Ephesus. He said what? He said, remember that place that you had fallen from in return. So Jesus understood, listen, you guys have fallen away from me, but if you could just remember where you were at when you first fell in love with me, when you first started walking with me, when you first got on fire with me, if you could just remember that, I believe, and he's Christ, so if he believed it, it's got to be true, I believe that that memory would jog an action of repentance and returning to me. So, I titled this message The Defense of Remembering. Right? Amen. Because that's exactly what's happened in Ephesus. Right? I, I, I'm not going to go through all of the history just because I think it took me 20 minutes last time just to do all that. But Ephesus had some hard-hitting preachers. But they were also played with every type of false teaching running along the church. So much that Timothy even, I mean, Paul tells us in Timothy that, listen, they had begun to teach these strange doctrines even in the church. That's exactly what was happening right here as John was writing to the church of Ephesus. They had been plagued with Gnosticism. They had been plagued with Docetism. They had been plagued with Antinomianism. They were plagued with every false teaching that could possibly influence the church. And what they were doing were leading people away based on these false teachings. And so John comes in and says, whoa, let me write a letter to y'all so we can try to help y'all out. 
But they out here telling you a whole lot of lies and y'all believe in it. And that ain't going to work. Because y'all leaving the faith. Y'all abandoning Christ to follow these heresies, to follow these teachings of the flesh. So today, we're going to cover verses 12 through 14, where John is going to talk about the defense of remembering. And basically what I mean by that is John is going to go in this passage, and he's going to talk about who we are in Christ. And I believe that the reason he brings all of that up is because in the next message that we go into, you'll hear him start talking about not to love the world and the things of the world. So I believe what he wants to do as he preludes into that message is remind them of who they are. So that if they truly understand who they are, if we truly understand who we are, we will not fall in love right. with the things of the world. And we will not be led away by the evil cunningness of our enemy, our adversary, right. Satan. Amen. So it reads, John says, I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. He says, I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who was from the beginning. He says, I'm writing to you, young man, because you have overcome the evil one. He says, I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who was from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. We must always remember that what we have in Christ is better than anything that Satan can offer us. Amen. See, it was Satan who took Jesus to the mountaintops and said, listen, I give all of this mm -hmm. to you if you just bow and worship me. That's right. wow. But like Jesus, we must always choose to only worship God, the Amen. true Amen. and living God. Amen. See, Satan may be able to. He's the, he's the prince and ruler of this earth. So he may be able to give you all of the things of this world, but what good is it to gain the world and lose your own soul? Lose your own soul. That's right. But John says, I'm writing to you, little children. Little children, this is a term of endearment. Yes. It's a term of endearment. He's saying, listen, the little ones who I love, who I care for, it's a word that, that, that denotes a, a parent's love for a child. And so it says, listen here, little children. He says, I'm writing to you because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Now, every time we see him use little children throughout this, he's speaking to the entire congregation of the church. So he's addressing the entire church right now. And he says, listen, I am writing to you because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. In other words, I'm writing this letter to you, church, because your sins have already been forgiven. See, the enemy may tempt us to walk away from God, but we must always remember our position with Christ. Amen. Remember, the purpose of this letter is to, to defend against the false teachings and exhort the church to stay with Christ yes. and not abandon him. But the whole reason he can encourage them to stay is because they already belong. Amen. That's something we got to remember. We already belong. Yes. Satan's trying to pull us away from the family that we already belong to. <laughs> See, forgiveness of God legally pardons us of all our sins, past, present, and future. And it restores our broken relationship with him as he adopts us into his family. Amen. What was the relationship that was broken? Why was it broken? Because of sin. What were we shaped in? Iniquity. What have we done since then? Transgressed the law. What were we? Sinners. And because we were sinners, the fellowship with God was broken. Yes. See, we must never forget that the nature of God could not allow us to have fellowship with him in our sin condition. But see, not only did our, fellow, did our sin separate us from God, it made us his enemy. Mm -hmm. It made us his enemy. Colossians 1, 21. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. See, the Bible teaches that because of our sin, we were not just separated from God, we were made his enemies. Like, do you get that? Like, do you really understand that? Like, it's not just he ain't like us. It's not just I ain't messing with you. He ain't like some of us. See, we, we just push you to the side. We ain't got to fool with you. But he said, no, you're my enemy. Yes. Check this, 2 Thessalonians 1.9. This is what he says about his enemies. He says, he will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. He says, they will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out 
from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. Wow. So the only thing that awaits the enemies of God is everlasting destruction. And that's what we were faced with, church. That was our position before we accepted Jesus Christ. All right. and, and, and I think we have to truly understand that. Because sometimes I think we, we just, you know, we got this Jesus thing going on. We didn't accept Christ. He with us. He forgiven us. He blessing us. And I think we forget what we were before he did that. Okay. And I think if we would really understand and understand that we were his enemies, I think we'll have a lot more gratitude. I think we'll praise him a lot more in those difficult times. I think we'll worship him even in those bad days or those stormy days because the reality is no matter how bad it is with Christ, I'm not his enemy anymore. Jesus said he didn't come to condemn the world. They were condemned already. Amen. See, the justice of God created a barrier that interposed against our sin. But I'm glad that the story didn't stop there, right? Amen. But through the blood of Jesus and our confession of Christ by faith, the veil was torn. And now we can approach the, uh, God's throne of grace with boldness. For Christ reconciled our broken relationship. Colossians 1.22, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. So the point that John is making is that if you have confessed faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then your sins have been forgiven. You went from enemy of God to child of God. Yes. And you already belong to the greatest family there is. Ooh. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Yes. So why walk away? only to once become the enemies of God. Why willingly place ourselves back under the hand of judgment that we had just escaped from? It's like someone escaping their abuser. Years later, fall in love, get a great guy, run into that abuser again, contact him, and that abuser is able to convince the person that ran away from them to come back. Why leave the comfort of love to go back to what you already know it's just pure agony and pain. We came to Christ because we recognized that it wasn't nothing out there for us. We didn't want to be the children of Satan anymore. We already understand that it's nothing out there positive for us. So why in our logical minds would we ever go back to that? Because we forgot. Because that's what Satan does. He makes us forget. He plants a little seeds in our ear. God don't love you. We suffer? Oh, he must not. I thought he said he got you. And we start thinking, man, I don't know. Oh, you going through something? Oh, you little broke guy, got a little, got a little, little change in your pocket? I thought God said that he provide for you. You out here borrowing money? Hmm. And you start forgetting how great he is and how good he is. Yes. And that he Amen. is provided for Amen. you. And that he is with, with you in your suffering. There's no greater fellowship than the fellowship with the Lord. Amen. Billy Graham said, remember, he wants your fellowship. And he has done everything possible to make it a reality. He has forgiven your sins at the cost of his own dear son. He has given you his word and the priceless privilege of prayer and worship. God gave up his only son to have fellowship with you. What if Satan in the world ever given up for you? I got a lot of time to wait, but I'm sure you won't think of nothing in the next <laughs> hour. Right. <laughs> but there's no greater being than God. And here's, the, here's the thing that really got me. There is no greater being conceivable than God at all. Amen. At all. Amen. Therefore, there's nobody over him imposing their will on him, making him provide salvation for us. He didn't have to do it. Amen. From the moment Adam sinned in the garden, he could have just left it there. Mm -hmm. He could have. He didn't grant salvation to the angels. We ain't the only ones that rebelled and sinned against God. His creation before us did too. When I say creation before, I mean angels. I'm not saying there was another world or another people. Amen. All right? Angels. Amen. <laughs> All right. Good clarifying. All right. Amen. All right? They were the, Satan and the angels, they were the first to rebel against God. But I don't see no salvation made for them. Hebrews 2.16, Aaron talked about it. For surely it is not angels he helps, 
but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he was made like them. Like them who? Fully human, like us in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. To do what? Make atonement for who? The sins of people, us, mankind. He didn't have to do that. Nobody made him. He makes us do some stuff. We got to do it. There's nobody higher than him. He wants us. And he doesn't want us for the same, because Satan wants us too. But God doesn't want us for the same reason that Satan wants us. See, Satan wants us for our destruction and our demise. Yes. God wants us for, to give us life, hope, and inheritance. Amen. It's a difference. Amen. Satan may take you to the mountain and tempt you with the world and your own desires. But not because he loves you, but because he wants to destroy you. He says, I'll give you. He will absolutely give it to you for no other reason than to destroy you with it. Satan offers you your destruction and he makes it look real pretty. He will promise you the things that God said no to. And we was mad that God said no anyway. So now you got the enemy coming along like, well, I'll get to you. So now we like, oh, snap. Well, I mean, God, if you love me, you would have gave to me. You said no, so, but he said, yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slide on over here to him, unless you're going to give it to me. We play that, right? Well, if God rocking with me today, I'm rocking with him. Oh, God ain't blessing me. I'm going to go ahead and get it myself. Mm. Wow. Wow. Ricky wow. Flame. <laughs> <laughs> See, God said no because it wasn't good for you. Uh-huh. Satan says yes because he knows it's not good for you and he wants you to have it. Uh-huh. So you'll be destroyed by it. Mm-hmm. See, he may give you the world, but he always keeps forgetting, ironically, this one little simple thing. He keeps forgetting to tell people. First John 2, 17, the world is passing away uh-huh. in the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides Forever. So for some reason, he keeps forgetting to tell people when he gives them the contract. Maybe it's in the fine print. I don't know. When he gives them the contract, that listen, you can have the world, but hey, by the way, it's not going to be around much longer. <laughs> hey, uh, 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 yeah, come on inside with me over God, but by the way, you know if you stay with God, though, you can live forever, right? He's not telling people that. He definitely forgets that. Maybe it's in the fine print, like I said. But I don't even want to read the contract. Right. Check this out. Ring. Hello. <laughs> Operator on the phone. How you doing? Um, you have a collect. This is have a collect call from as hot as ever down here prison. <laughs> <laughs> from inmate serving a death on death row. Satan. Would you like to accept the call? Click. Click. <laughs> and please put me on the do not call list. <laughs> Like, don't even engage in it. Right? Fix your eyes on Christ and make no provisions for the flesh. Don't even entertain that clown. Amen. That's right. But we entertain him. Next thing you know. But for those who have been forgiven, Satan, for those who have been forgiven, Satan should have nothing ever to tempt us with. That should ever cause us to want to willingly break fellowship with God. Not if you truly understand your position. Yes. Yes. Not if you truly understand that you were a sinner and God didn't have to save you, but he chose to because he wants you and he loves you. Yes. See, here's the beauty of rocking with God through it all. See, God's kingdom never perishes. Amen. Hallelujah. The gifts he gives are stored up forever. Yes. Yes. Our inheritance, well, yes. everything. Yes. See, he said Amen. Join Eric with Christ. All that is Christ, I will give you. So God gave up everything to give it to you. That's crazy. If you can conceive that, you know, the old preacher said he banked up heaven so he can put it in your account. That's crazy. God gave up everything. Why should I willingly give it back? Satan, do you have an answer for that? Ask him. Satan, can you answer me that question? What makes what, why should I come to you? Mm-hmm. He doesn't have an answer at all. What he'll say is, because, you know, I can give you the things you want. Mm-hmm. We got to move past the things we want and start to understand that God's going to give us the very things that we need. Amen. 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 But John isn't writing this letter because he's bored either. So as stupid as it sounds that people will walk away from God to follow Satan, 
John isn't just bored looking for something to do. He's writing this letter because this is what's happening. Uh -huh. This is what's happening in Ephesus. They are walking away from the church. They are abandoning God to return back to eternal judgment. Mm -hmm. And it happens today regularly. Yes. People seeking that instant gratification. That's all that Satan can offer you Come on. is the right Come now. Mm -hmm. I can give you the riches now. God wants you to wait. But I got it right now. So for chase, so we're chasing immediate and instant gratification. I'm running right to hell. Amen. This is how I think about it. Here's the kingdom of Satan. This is how I perceive it. Um, I get paid every other Friday. And I view what Satan has to offer me as my, my paycheck. I get it. But it's temporary and usually gone before I ever get to enjoy it. <laughs> That's the kingdom of Satan. It's temporary and I'll perish before I ever really get to enjoy it. But with God, it's permanent and I can enjoy it for the rest of eternity. Amen. Amen. So John reminds us of our position that we have fellowship with God. We are not his enemies any longer. And that fellowship is sweet and pleasant. Remember that and remain steadfast against whatever lies the enemy is trying to tell you. He only wants to draw you away from God in order to have some company in hell. We know he is the deceiver. Stop letting him deceive you. Amen. But then John says this. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who was from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who was from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. So, the very smart people, like the people that's smarter than me, um, <laughs> you know, I always say that they always argue about everything. Right? So, you know, our scholars and stuff, they, everything's an argument and like everything. Like, God so loved the world. Well, you know, what is so mean? <laughs> right? I mean, I'm not lying. Like, they argue over what is all mean. Does all really mean all? This is, like, I'm telling you, this is the argument. I'm not making this up. This is what they argue about. This is the stuff that I read and get confused myself about and then just be like, all right, well, this is what I'm going to say. Um, <laughs> Amen. But they argue about these classes, fathers, young, young men, children. What is he talking about here? Is he talking in age? Is he talking spiritual maturity? What is he talking about? Let's put it like this. When he says fathers, he's not talking about dads or just men. John is talking about those who have a deeper understanding of the faith. They are those who have added some years to their beginning knowledge of God. They are the fully mature believers. All right. When he says young men, he's referring to those who are not fully mature, but they're growing in wisdom. That's me. Right? They are strong <laughs> enough to hold their own, but not strong enough to be left on their own. That's why pastor don't let me just do stuff all the time by myself. <laughs> <laughs> this is why he always has my go to meetings with me. Let me keep him in check. <laughs> right? When he says children, there's a lot of debate about that, but John doesn't use the slang language that he uses when he says little children. Here he uses a different language, and this language speaks to a child that still needs to be trained up. When he talks about children, he's talking about those who are new to the faith, babes in Christ. Now, depending on who you're reading, they might argue that, but that's fine. But the church operates like the natural developments of life in our own spiritual growth. We come in as children, we progress to young men, and we should all eventually be fathers, those who are fully mature. But that's why it doesn't refer to age, because you got people who've been walking with the Lord for 30, 40 years, and, you know, it's up to debate. But it doesn't matter which stage we are in with the, within the body. We must all remember what we have in Christ already. I don't care if you're a babe, a young man, or a father. We must still all remember what we have in Christ already. Whatever stage you're at, you have something in Christ. Remember it. Hold on to that when the enemy wants to attack you. All right? So although John is addressing a specific group, understand that for us, the reader, it all applies. And the words of each group is something that we can all add to our defense of remembering. So when he says to the fathers, I'm writing you because you know him, him who was from the beginning, we talked about in the first message. All four of those messages, by the way, are on the line if you want to know what I'm talking about. But the first message we talked about, John says, about him who was from the beginning. Who was him who was from the beginning? What well, he says who it is. It's Christ. Mm -hmm. 
So when he says, listen, I write to you, Father, because you know him who was from the beginning, he's saying, listen, I'm talking to the mature in the faith who know him who was from the beginning, who know Christ, right? Those who have been genuinely walking with Christ have an intimacy with Christ that has birthed knowledge that should not be swayed. Listen, by a show of hands, how many people will let somebody come in off the streets and tell you that Pastor Ron is absolutely mean and rude? Show your hands. All right. <laughs> Why not? Why not? You know him. You know him. I wish he would be rude to some people sometimes. <laughs> but he won't. <laughs> it's just not in his nature. Right? You can't convince me otherwise because I have intimate relationship with him. That's all of us do. You can't. Even if it appeared that way. That's just your perception because it's not him. It must be out of context, right? Because it's not him. Amen. But the same should be even greater for Christ. Amen. See, we'll defend our own pastors, and I ain't. I love you, pastor. I ain't knocking you, right? But there are people who will defend their pastor and won't sway on the convincing of them when it's evidence that they ain't right. But they'll walk away from Christ real quick. So they'll let the enemy tell them something about Christ before they let the, us tell them something about their pastor. We should have that type of uh, 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 belief system. We should have that type for, for Christ. Amen. We should hold that tightly to who we know Christ is. Amen. Amen. Here's what he means by the word truth. I mean, no, but that's important. No. He's not talking about a cognitive knowledge. He's talking about knowledge through experience, experiential knowledge. It is that knowledge that is gained through observation and the use of your senses. It, 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 it goes further than me just reading a book. What it means is that I've walked with Christ, and in my walk with Christ, he has revealed things to me that nobody can convince me otherwise. As I've walked with him, I've learned him. I've known him. i prayed specifics. He's answered them. I've needed him. He was there. I was down and out. He lifted me up. You can't tell me that he's not who he say he is. Because I've walked with him and experienced that. Amen. That's why I don't care who it is. You not telling me nothing about Christ. Not if it ain't right. And you definitely not going to pull me. I don't even want to hear it. I get real aggravated with it. Get out of here. I don't even know what you're talking about. Get off YouTube. Read the Bible. Your pastor's not right. So listen. <laughs> I'm all right. I told you I'm the younger dog. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, we have to start leaning on what we know. But see, if we're not walking intimately with him, we ain't getting that revealed knowledge. We don't know Amen. these things. Amen. John was so close to God in Christ that he said, listen, when they were uh, uh, trying to deny the incarnation of Christ in chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, he said, hold up. Listen to this. That which we've heard, that which we've seen, that's what we've touched with our hands. We proclaim concerning the word of life. That life appeared, and we testify to it. What he okay. said was, listen, you can tell me that God, your Christ, was not the incarnate God, but you can't convince me because I've walked with him. I've seen him. Yes. I've talked with him. i touched the holes in his hand. Don't tell me he didn't raise the new life. I saw him. He revealed himself to me. We watched him ascend into heaven before he gave us the command to go preach the word to the nation. You don't know what you're talking about. Stop listening to people that don't know what they're talking about. You got people that ain't never picked up the Bible a day in their life, but they want to keep telling you what it's saying. You read it and you believe it. <laughs> I get it. Man, I'd be, ah, I'm trying to tell my wife will tell you. I'd be falling like, what are you not talking to me? I'm trying to work on this, this thing, this love and gentleness. You about to make me come out of my head. John said, listen, I'm not paying attention to these little antichrists. That's what he called them, antichrists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Paul takes it even further. He said, listen, these are the doctrines of demons. <laughs> you are spreading these lies, man. These are the doctrine of demons. Call them demons. People say, that's not nice. Well, Paul said it. <laughs> Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> right? But listen, in the same way that John was not going to be swayed because he had personal, intimate knowledge with God, we should not be swayed either. Amen. 
fully mature or not, we all have experienced something great about Christ. Amen. If not, you wouldn't be here still. Amen. You've experienced something that has told you he is real. John 6, 68, 69, Jesus gave this entire message, and at the end of it, all of the false disciples walked away. He turned to his disciples and said, you going to leave? Mm -hmm. Peter, always speaking up, said, Lord, whom shall we go? Right. You have the words of eternal life. And we come to know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Listen, where else do we go? We've been walking with you. I don't like your Christ. Like there's nothing else to be offered to me. I can't leave you. There's nothing left. John says to know Christ, therefore don't let the enemy lie to you about what you know. Know what you know and know that you know it. <laughs> Remember what Christ has taught you in those intimate moments and don't let him who, who we know is a liar come and make you doubt Christ. But the young man, he say this. He says, I'm writing to you, young man, because you have overcome the evil. John says in chapter 5, 4, that, uh, chapter 5, verse 4, that those who have put their faith in Christ have overcome the world. The world belongs to the evil one. Overcoming the world is overcoming the evil one. So, who is it who overcomes the evil one? Have all of you put your faith in Christ? So you are all overcomers. Amen. See, this is why John's reminding us. We don't even know. We are all overcomers in Christ. Period. So it doesn't matter if you're fully mature or babe. We, it all applies to us. But here's what he's teaching. Victory over the enemy was completed by Christ. When we confess faith in Christ, we become victorious with him. Amen. See, until Christ returns, there will always be a battle going on between us and Satan. Yes. But what we have to understand is that we don't have to worry about losing because Romans 8, 20, uh, 37 says what? That we are more than conquerors through Christ. The Greek meaning there is that we have conquered completely without any real threat of physical life or health. In other words, we fight from victory, not for victory. The battle is already won. It doesn't matter what the enemy does. He can't beat you. And he knows it. This is why since you have victory in Christ, Christ, his plan is to pull you away from Christ, if it's possible. What do I mean by that? You'll discuss it in Bible study. <laughs> but here's the thing, though. Here's the thing. Here's what it looks like. You ever watch... <laughs> Ever watch Go to State play? You ever notice that sometimes they hold benches playing in the fourth court? Right? They win by that much? Right. Right? This is what our victory looks like. See, listen, we gotta stay in the game because we gotta finish the game. But once once they put their bench in in the fourth quarter, guess why? Because they not they're not gonna lose. They already won. But you gotta finish the game. They can't forfeit because then they'll lose. So they just put the bench in. They're beating them that badly. But then you ever notice when those person that's getting beat really bad, they come down, do something fancy, slam dunk on somebody and the losing team, and the crowd goes crazy as if like they're about to win. No. <laughs> Big deal, you slam dunk. You're losing. It doesn't matter what you do. Do it again. Shoot a three. You lost. Right? That's what our victory looks like. It doesn't matter what the enemy does. You lost. Period. Point blank. Do whatever you want to do. Well, look down at verse 14. I about the young man, he also say, I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. See, our victory, our, we are victorious already. But notice I said we still got to finish the game. See, John says to finish the game, we must be strong and our strength comes from the word of God. The only defense against a lie is the truth. Jesus said to the Father, he said, sanctify them with the truth. Your word is the truth. Word is the truth. The only defense against a lie is the truth. So many people in the game weak because they ain't got no strength behind them. They ain't got no word inside them. How you gonna resist the devil when you ain't got nothing to resist them with? Mm -hmm. He says God is evil. Can you take him to the Bible and say that he's not? He says you ugly. Can you take him to the Bible where God says you're beautiful? Yeah. He says you don't got no value. Can you take him to where the Bible he says that you, that you have value? Mm -hmm. Can you? That's the only way you can defend against the lies he's trying to plant in your head. You've got to be able to combat it with that's what Jesus did. Yeah. That was said something. Jesus said, yeah, what did God say? John says, always remember that we fight from victory. In that way, we should remain steadfast against the lies of the enemy and to strengthen ourselves by the word of God. Could you imagine Steph Curry asking to be traded right now? 
<laughs> that would be foolish. Not if you want to win a championship. And I'm a Cleveland fan, I hope we win, but I'm realistic too. Right? <laughs> now, now, unless, unless, well, let's be real though. Understand something. Steph Curry is a, is a Christian. He's our brother. Yes. So as much as we want to, we have to resist the temptation to not pray that he be healed. His ankle's messed up. We got to pray for him. He's our brother. I know we don't want to. He was in July. Yeah, right. He was in July. Just saying, like, we want him out, but, you know, we got the Bible tell us, pray for those who are sick and hurt We got to pray for them. All right, let me go on. Let's get it. But about the child, he says, I write to you, children, because you know the Father. Brother Elroy in Bible study one time, he said, man, listen, I don't know all that doctrine and, and theology and stuff, man, but listen, all I know is God loves me. So simple. So profound. He says, listen, to the little children, right, the new people in Christ, he said, listen, you know your father. That's all, like, it's so simple, but it's so deep. Yes, it is. See, I'm keeping 100. Theology and doctrine ain't going to sustain you. It's not. Half the time, it's probably going to confuse you. It's depending on who's teaching it, right? Right. But the one thing you can never be confused about, ever, ever, is that God loves you. Amen. Amen. Period. Although someone may be new as a believer, they know their daddy. And they can hold on to that. Remember, Romans 8 said, listen, that those who profess Christ, the spirit of God lives in them. And that spirit of God confirms our adoption as children. And by it, we cry out. Our Father, Daddy. So listen, I may not have, you might be new in, in the crisis, you may not have all of the, you know, that, that deep stuff that ain't really that deep anyway, but you have the Spirit of God confirming with you that you are a child of God and he is your daddy. Yeah, amen. And God said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow it. Yeah, See, knowing your daddy is all you really need because if you know your daddy, guess what you also know? Them counterfeits. <laughs> right? Yeah. So the angel may be, I mean, Satan may be coming masquerading as an angel of light, but see, I know my daddy, so nah, I'm cool. I ain't going with you. Go pick up my son. Take him away from me. Bet you he cried. Maybe not. He's too young right now. Wait, you like four or five months. Bet you he cried. Ain't my daddy. He know his parents. Right? We must always remember who our daddy is. And teach my, I teach my kids, don't talk to strangers. Right. I don't your daddy. Don't, even, don't talk to the enemy. Ain't your daddy? You don't know that man? You shouldn't. If you do know him, let's have another conversation. What you doing hanging out with that person? You know how you know you're a parent, your kids come home with the wrong? We gotta talk. Why you hanging around them group of people? You know they're bad influence, right? You have to sit down. Sometimes we gotta sit down and have a conversation like that with some of us. Like, why you, why you entertaining? You know he a bad influence. Let's wrap this up. The eye of the storm. <laughs> the eye of the storm. <laughs> Come on, our children. The eye of the storm is directly over the church. We must remember those things which are true in order to not be swayed. See, the call to remember does not come without action or response. See, biblically, we are never called to remember just for the sake of remembering. Our call to remember as believers requires us to respond. I don't believe John was just saying these things to take up paper. He wanted them to remember and respond, and the way he wants us to respond is to persevere through the finish line. He wants us to remember, and then our response is that we stay steadfast and we persevere. Our response is that we don't leave the faith. Our response is that we stay unmovable, unwaverable, right? That's the way we should respond as our memories are jogged about those things that we have in Christ. This is the head of the message. See, my heart is that Jesus never has to call us back. Never. I don't want anybody in here to ever have to be called back to Jesus. I want us to stay with him. Because why, why, why are we leaving? I can't keep it. That still blows my mind. And it's not, and listen, I'm, I'm not acting like we don't go through stuff. And, and the, look, there are plenty of times that I ain't going to lie to you. The thought thing came to my head like, man, what am I doing this for? But I kid you not, every time I bring myself right back to reality. Amen. And I remind myself. Everything that I have in Christ. Amen. Period. And I count the blessings that I have. Yes. Every day. I mean, we ain't rich and balling out of control, but man, we don't want for nothing. Amen. Period. Amen. My wife was off work for eight weeks without getting paid. We struggle. And we had to pay for stuff that we didn't want to pay for. 
You know what I'm saying? We have to borrow money like we thought we would have to do. He sustained us. Glory to God. Amen. That's what he does. Yes. So he can't come out here and tell me he ain't got me. No, he do. Amen. Let me take you down a journey of my life. See, there is power in our ability to remember, which is why Satan wants us to forget. He lies to us because he knows no one will ever leave God if he tells the truth about his love, mercy, forgiveness. Faithfulness. And we can go all day on, on with the goodness of God. But Paul told Timothy in verse 4, 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 2, he said, Out of spirit expressly says, What? That in the later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons through the, uh, through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared. You know, some words I just, you know. <laughs> Can't say those S's together like that. But, <laughs> but Jesus said, listen, it's going to go from worse, bad to worse. Mm -hmm. So that means we're dealing with it a lot worse today. Matthew 24, he said, listen, it's going to go from bad to worse right before, the, right before Jesus returns. So they had it rough in Ephesus. How bad do you think we got? Mm -hmm. The enemy wants us, but we must remember to hold on. And see, maybe you've already walked away, either physically or in your mind. You know, maybe you have returned your back on the Lord. Or maybe you're thinking it. Maybe mentally you're gone from God. You still come to church going through the motions. But mentally, you already checked out. Then there's another response that the call to remember should have. It's the response of repentance and return. It's what he said in Revelation, right? Remember and return. Repent. Remember that it was Jesus who saves you. Amen. Remember that it's Jesus who loves you. Yes. And he still stands like the father of the prodigal, open arms, waiting to receive you, waiting to give you a seat at the table. Yes. Mm. All right. The inheritance can be yours once again. Your path can change once more from destruction to life. But you got to choose to stop listening to what the enemy is trying to tell you. It's not true. Mm -hmm. I promise you, it's not True. I don't even know all y'all stuff. But I know he, he ain't ever right. Ever. He ain't been right about nothing. Period. Ever. Name something. Please. Nothing. <laughs> the ability to remember is a powerful defense against the attack of Satan and his lies. And he knows it. The love and goodness of God. Why would you ever leave that? The world is everything it has to offer. The world and everything it has to offer is quickly passing away. But the kingdom of God that awaits you will last forever. John wants us to remember who we are. Remind yourself every day in the mirror. I'm a child of God. I've been saved. I've been forgiven. I have fellowship with the most high God. Tell yourself that every day. Reflect on the truths of the word of God. And withstand the things that the enemy is trying to say to you. He wants you away from God because he wants to destroy you. Yes. Don't let him win, church. Amen. 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 Amen.